We're going to start into a two-part talk today, and I, it's kind of awkward um, because a lot of you might not, be, might not be back for part two, but I couldn't get all of this message into one message. Even someone who preaches as long as I do, I couldn't get it all in one message. And so today is going to be part A, next week's going to be part B, and just kind of tipping you off ahead of time, at the end of today's part, it's going to be depressing. Um, but next week, it's going to be incredibly encouraging and hopeful. And so I don't know if it's a good idea or not to preach a message that's in two halves like that, but we are going to talk about the finished work of Jesus at the end, and there will be hope and victory to everybody who wants to step into that work. But we're talking about the spiral of sin and temptation. Does anybody even need a message on that, or you already pretty well think you could give the message on the spiral of sin and temptation? No, no one knows about that? Okay, well, then I'll talk to, about it today, about how that works. It's a, a little snapshot of it would be like this. Um, a thought comes into your mind, a temptation comes into your life. You know it's not from the Lord, but after a minute, you give it enough time, and then you actually go for it. That's called sinning. And then once you do that, um, you're frustrated because you didn't really want to do it. I mean, part of you wanted to do it, but part of you didn't want to do it, but then you did it and you're kind of frustrated and you feel bad about what happened and maybe feel guilt or some remorse uh, about what happened. And then you promise yourself and maybe some other people that you are never going to do that again. But in fact, you did do it again. In fact, some of you are here right now doing it like right now, not like in this moment, but you're in that spot where you're doing that thing right now. That thing that you said, I'll never do that thing anymore. You're doing that thing. And if that spiral goes around enough times in our lives where it leads us is feeling like there's something wrong with us or there's something wrong with the gospel or both. And what I have discovered in my life, long life of being a follower of Jesus is that a lot of people bail out at that point. They're like, either I, I don't get it or it's not real. I'm out. But a lot of people stay in and they keep showing up at stuff week after week after week, but they're living a defeated life, believing that they can't change that part of their story. In fact, that's the lie that the enemy has put in some of your minds already today. You're here, you're giving it your best shot, but the seed has already been planted that this isn't going to work for you. In fact, the seed may have already been planted while I'm talking about that spiral of sin and temptation that you're like, hey, don't get your hopes up because remember that other time when you got your hopes up, but it didn't work. And remember you were at that retreat and you got your hopes up, but it didn't work. And that time you got real fired up about it and got your hopes up and it didn't work. And the enemy's already planted a seed in somebody's mind today that it's just not going to work for you. You're going to have to live with the defeat. But I'm telling you, Jesus did not go into the grave and come up out of the depths so that you and I could live defeated lives. He came out of the tomb, vacated hell itself so that you and I could live in his victory. And that's the seed that you need to plant in your mind right now. Last week, we talked about taking every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus. We talked about tearing down strongholds. In fact, the text that we read last week, the core, if you missed it, was this, 2 Corinthians 10. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, see, that's what this series is all about. This is not like a little uh, nursery rhyme Bible story for us on an adult level for the next few weeks. This is about hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is about taking back your life, taking back your thoughts, taking back your marriage, taking back your view of the future. This is about saying to the enemy, hey, enough is enough, and you're not stealing anything else from me. You may have taken a bunch, but you're not taking any more. You may have had the last few years, but you're not going to have the next few years. It's about realizing that there's strongholds in our life. Some of you were born into the stronghold, right? Your grandmother had that stronghold. And when you were old enough, you realize, my mom has my grandmother's stronghold. 
And then in time, you started waking up to the reality that as much as you said, I'll never be like them, that stronghold has got a hold on you. And for a whole lot of us, we just say, you know what? This is going pretty good. This is going not too bad. And that's just my deal. I just have to live with it. And Jesus is saying, no, that is not your deal. And you do not have to live with it. I didn't come here and defeat death, hell, sin, and the grave and come back with resurrection power and offer you the Holy Spirit so that you could just live with that stronghold because your grandmother passed that down to you. I came that you could demolish the strongholds. See, that's a new mindset. And some of you, when you hear that word, you're like, I don't know. I don't even know how I would live without that stronghold. It's become like second nature to me to have that stronghold in my life. And Jesus is saying, yeah, it may be second nature, but it's not the spirit's nature. It is not Jesus' nature. It is not the new birth nature. It is not God's nature for you to live like that. He said, we have the power divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments in every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And the thought that we need to take captive right now before I preach anymore is the thought that it's never going to be different. Let's take that thought captive right now in Jesus' name. Right now, let's just take the thought captive that says it's always going to be this way. And I am never going to be set free. Let's take that thought captive and let's ask God to rewrite a new story in our minds. The possibility that this spiral of sin and temptation can be blown up in our lives. But before we do that, I feel like it's going to be helpful for you and for me to get reacquainted with what's going on in our world and to understand what we're going to have to do to make the adjustments necessary to live a different kind of life. I mean, I'm asking the question as I'm praying this week, do we really want to live a different kind of life? So I just asked that question to you today and give you a chance to answer. Do you really want to live a different kind of life? Do you want to live free from that addiction? Do you want to live free from that kind of spirit or that kind of thinking or that negativity or that weight that you've been carrying? Do you want to live free? And if you do, you can, but you have to understand what's going on around you. I've mentioned it a lot of times before, but I loved halftime of the Auburn games for the decade that I was with the team. Because at halftime, the normal fan is feeling good in the stands about the score on the scoreboard, or maybe the fact that we pass for X number of yards or rush for X number of yards. But the coaches, our coaches are brilliant, and they've observed the entire game. They, they see the big picture. So our guys would come in the locker room. Everybody would get nutrition, um, but then pretty quickly reorganize into defense and offense, sitting there watching a, a wall where some slides were going to be put up via projector, and the coaches just walk straight in and says, okay, first slide, boom. When we're running X, this is what they're doing. They're putting these two guys over here and this guy over here. They're looking like they're going to run this, but they're actually running this. And that's what's stopping us. Here's what we're going to do about it. When they do this, now, second half, we're going to do this. We're making this adjustment. And great coaching is all about the adjustment that you're willing to make at the half. And it's halftime for a lot of us in this room today. And God is giving you the opportunity to say, what is the enemy doing to me? And what adjustments am I going to need to make to win the second half? And I believe it can happen. So let's look at that spiral of sin and temptation. Let's talk about it for a minute and let's try to understand what's happening to us. Number one, the first part of the spiral of sin and temptation is that obviously a temptation from the enemy enters our minds. So that's the first thing that happens and it happens all day long. Look, if you will, at James chapter one, beginning in verse 13. This explains what happens to us when this thought from the enemy comes into our minds. It says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But here's what actually happens, verse 14. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. 
And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So the first thing that you and I have to sort of, I guess, you know, be awakened to is the fact that the beginning of this spiral for us is a thought that comes into our minds, and it's coming into our minds via the enemy. In other words, just reminding us today, you and I are not free agents living in a vacuum, making decisions and choices. We are on a battlefield stamped by the image of God and targeted by the enemy of God. An enemy who hates God and wants to destroy everything he can that bears his name, namely you. And he has a plan for your life. And I know it's not like super great news on a, on a Sunday, but his plan is to bury you. He wants to bury your dreams, bury the purpose God put in you, bury your self-image, your self-worth, bury your hope, bury your marriage, bury your relationship with your kids, bury everything you have got woven into you by creation. He wants to bury it all. And he's got all kinds of time and no mercy. And he's going to put a thought in your mind that is contrary to God's best for your life. So how does that work? We talked about it last week, looking at Genesis chapter three. How does he do that? A couple of different ways. Just to recap, because I like bringing him out into the light. And I don't want you to go away from this talk being like hyper paranoid about the devil. I, I don't want us to walk away and it's like, oh my goodness, the devil's around every corner. You know, like I, I, I you know, just dumb example, but I got ready to go to work and my car wouldn't start. It was the devil was in my, my, my car. <laughs> I cast the devil out of my car. It's like, no, you just need to get some jumper cables, man. And <laughs> get hooked up with somebody else and get a new battery. It's not like a demon in there. It's just the battery's not good. So you don't need to get hyper, like concerned about the devil. Like every time something happens, the devil is in it. But you also cannot go through life with blinders on thinking that you're making all the decisions because you have an enemy and he is putting thoughts in your path every single day with the ultimate hope of burying you. And how does he do it? I'll tell you how he does it. Genesis 3, verse 1 says a few things about him as we read down through that text. Number one, it says that he's crafty. He's more crafty than all of the creatures that God had made. Now, when we say the serpent was crafty, we know the serpent, serpent is the enemy. We know the enemy is Satan. We know Satan was an angel, a, a very high-ranking angel who defected from heaven and rebelled and re revolted against God and fell from heaven, the scripture says, like a star falls from the sky. So here is a created angel that Daniel says about this created being the, the enemy, that he was full of wisdom and beauty. So he wasn't like a, you know, seventh-rate angel who just fell off the back of the wagon and all of a sudden now he's running the darkness. He was a brilliant angel. So your foe is somebody you've got to take seriously because he masquerades like an angel of light half the time. And the Bible says about him, God says about him, he's more crafty than everything else that's been created. And he, he's potentially more crafty than you. And he's not going to come through the front door of your life and say, man, I'm going to bury you. Cool. All right, good. Just do these following steps and then I'll destroy everything by this time next year. He's not going to roll into somebody's life and say, man, here's a picture of you 18 months from now living in a meth house. No, he's going to come through the back door or the side door with some crafty plan. It says in James 1 right here, there's a couple of things going on. It says that we are pulled away by our own evil desire. Some translations say by our lust. That's our fallen sinful nature. 
But then look what it says about that. We're pulled away by our own evil desire and then dragged away and enticed. The word enticed means allure, to, to, to put up a front and to hold out on what's really true on the backside. It's like anybody here that's been fishing before. Um, you, you don't go fishing and pull out a bullhorn when you're out in the boat doing some bass fishing on a quiet morning and, and just announce to all the fish as loud as you can, hey, everybody, just like to get all your attention down there. We're up here in the boat and we're going to throw hooks overboard. You're going to bite them and then we're going to jerk on the line really hard and the hook's going to go through your jaw, like through your gill. But don't worry, we're going to reel in the, the line and get you close to the boat. Do we need details really seriously? We're going to pull the hook out with a pair of pliers. It has a barb on it. It's going to be a mess. We're going to whack you over the head with a stick, throw you in a cooler with ice. You're going to freeze to death, but you'll be semi-unconscious. Go fishing. <laughs> We're going to scrape all your scales off. <laughs> Fillet you. And fry you. Everybody ready? No. No, you check the conditions. You're smart. You talked to the guy at the tackle shop. You consulted with the other fisherman's friend. You've been here before. You know what the temperature is. You look at your options and you go, this guy maybe? He looks cool. No, hooks are too obvious. These fish are smart. Let's go with this guy. Look at that spinning. <laughs> and that fish is like. <laughs> wow. That's how you fish. And that 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 fish is like, I, I'm I'm all in on this one. Bam! I got it. See, this is how the enemy is, is working on you. He's not going to roll up and go, hey, I would like to, I'd like for you to swallow that if you, if you don't mind. <laughs> so you have to be smart. You have to understand you have to be ahead of the curve, and you have to be prepared to do some fighting. The second way he works is he challenges God's truth. We talked about that last week. Did God really say? The third thing he's always going to do is he's going to attack God's character and his intentions. God's holding out on you. That's what he convinced Eve of. God's got something that he doesn't want you to have because he doesn't want you to have what he has. Therefore, you can't trust him. The fourth thing he does is he promises something that he can't deliver. He says, you eat from this fruit, your eyes are going to be open. You're going to have this incredible revelation. You're going to be like God. Wow, this is going to be amazing. Over promises what he cannot deliver. The next thing that he always seems to wrap up is he appeals to basic human needs. It says a few verses later in verse 6 that she saw that the fruit was good. She knew and understood that it would make her wise. So she had these basic needs that he was playing into, and you and I have basic needs as well. You say, well, what are they? We all have common needs for acceptance, for worth, for satisfaction, for fulfillment, and for happiness. And the enemy has a way of saying, hey, this is going to make you happy, and you need some happy right now because everything has gone to pot in your world, and you need a little happy, and you deserve a little happy, and I'm going to get you a little happy. Well, you do need a little happiness in your life, and everything has gone to pot all around you. 
And you do, in a way, need something to kind of brighten the outlook. That is a basic human need to want to be happy. But he plays into that, overpromising what he can't deliver. The last thing we saw in this text is that he often uses other people to encourage you in your hasty choices. It says in verse six that she eventually ate the fruit, then she gave it to Adam, and he also ate it. It was kind of like a domino effect for both of them. And some of you are in that boat right now. And if you're going to change this spiral that we're going to be at the bottom of in just a few minutes, you're going to have to change your circle because your circle is rolling out a red carpet for you to do dumb things. And it's probably because they are not living in the full potential of what God has for their life. And they want some company down on the first floor where they are. And if you're not careful, they're going to co-op you in to where they're living. Their marriage is on the rocks right now. Everything's out of sorts with them. They've given up hope and they want you to come down there and join them. So when you say we're struggling right now, we're kind of in this zone where we're fighting a lot right now, or she or he did something stupid, they capitalize on that and say, man, you know what? You deserve better. You know what? You shouldn't be with them anyway. You know what? You can't trust them. That guy's not worth it. She's not worth it. The whole thing's not worth it, man. Let's go on a beach trip. We need a beach trip. We need a girl's trip. We need to go push the boundaries a little bit. Have a few too many extra drinks. Maybe flirt with some of the guys at the bar. We need to go have some fun because we deserve that and you deserve that. And all of a sudden, you are called to greatness. You are made to be in the image of God. You're a daughter of a king and God wanted to set you free by the victory and the power of Jesus. But somehow, you've gotten in an elevator with the wrong people and instead of taking you up to your God destiny, they took you down to where they've been living. And it may be that if you're gonna get serious about victory and breaking strongholds in your life, you're gonna have to say goodbye to some of the people in your circle. You're like, well, what? You know, I'm the only Christian they know, and they're, if I'm not in their life, all that stuff. We've all said that a hundred times. That's just a bunch of rationalization to not making the kind of decisions that will set you free. The enemy sometimes knows his best approach is not for him to do the talking, it's for Janelle to do the talking. The second step in the spiral of sin and temptation is that we act on the thought, the temptation, and we sin. We act and we sin. We let that thought pitch a tent and build a fire and stay too long, and eventually we act with the thought or an action or an attitude, and we sin. Can we just say that together? And we sin. We do. Not Janelle did. Not it's all my friend's fault. I did. I let that thought pitch a tent in my mind. It won the battle of my mind, and ultimately, there was a thought or an attitude or an action that corresponded to that thought was contrary to God's best, and I sinned. That's the second step in this spiral of sin and temptation. The third thing that happens in this spiral is there is usually momentary pleasure when we sin. I wanted so bad to get an amen on that today, but nobody was willing to go there. This is part of the story that we often skip over in church. But you have to be honest if you're going to try to see us all have a brand new way of life. Sin is fun for a minute. Some sin is fun for a minute. Still no amens. No one here has ever had any momentary fun sinning. It's incredible. I mean, this church is going to change the world. It's like, come join us. We have never fallen. I mean, we are amazing people. The way that it says it in Proverbs 14 is pretty accurate. Check this out, verse 12. Just give me a little amen somewhere along the way. 
if you think this is true. Not for your life, but you know a friend or a relative or a neighbor <laughs> that may have experienced this in life. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. You've seen that with your family members, right? Your friends, your coworkers. But look at verse 13. Even in laughter, the heart may ache and joy may end in grief. The translation I grew up with said, even in laughter, the heart may be in pain and the end of a good time is often sorrow. I was like, man, that sounds like the average weekend. We were laughing so hard. We were having such an amazing time. And then I ended up back in my house by myself again, feeling the exact same thing I felt before we went. Or worse. So there is that little momentary blip. It says that even about Moses in Hebrews. It says that he chose not to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, rather to endure hardship as a servant with the people of God. So God even acknowledges that on earth, with our earthly nature, there's there's some joy momentarily in making bad decisions, but it doesn't last. That's the fourth part of this spiral of sin and temptation. The fourth part is we discover sin's hook. And before you know it, It's right in our mouth, tearing through our heart. That happened in verse 7 in Genesis 3. All of a sudden, it says that the man and the wife, they both ate from the tree, and the very next line says, and they both realized that they were naked. Somehow, they had managed all the way up to this point to be naked and not even know they were naked, but now instantaneously, they knew something was wrong in their world, and they made a covering for their nakedness. They knew that what was promised was over-promised. And instead of what was promised, now there was the momentary, this is actually really good. I'm sure the fruit didn't taste horrible. There there was a like, man, not bad. (laughs) Yeah, not not bad at all. This is actually pretty good. But instead of, voila, we have this amazing experience, it was, oh, wow, we're naked. And now with that nakedness, the fifth thing happened, and this is what happens as we're spiraling down. There are feelings that we're met with of frustration, guilt, and shame. How do you know they felt that way? Well, because they went to church and the Church made them feel that way about being naked. Nope. Well, that some pastor told them they should feel bad about being naked. Nope. You see, you can't blame the effects of sin on culture because God is the one who created you to be like him. And when you miss the mark, when I miss the mark, there is an effect that happens in our soul. And so there are going to be feelings that come to us of frustration and of shame and of guilt because we are missing the mark of what God intended us to be. The frustration, primarily, I think some of you will relate to this, is with you. You're just frustrated with you. You're like, I cannot believe I did that again. I cannot believe I went there again. I cannot believe I went down that road again. I cannot believe I've got this hook stuck in my heart again. And there's so much frustration and so much shame and so much guilt comes into the equation. And so here we are. We started out with this, hey, this is going to be amazing And all of a sudden, we're down here. This is not amazing. In fact, I feel horrible. I didn't feel great to start with, and that's partly why I did it. But I feel a whole lot worse now than I did then. The sixth thing that happens, and this is where the tide turns a little bit. The sixth thing that happens in this spiral is that the enemy shifts to a new tactic. All the way up into this point, he is all about enticing. He is all about the promise. But as soon as you hit guilt, and shame and frustration, he steps out of the role of the enticer and he moves into the role of being the accuser and the condemner. 
and immediately he's all over your case. And he's telling you, you are the dumbest person I've ever seen. You are the poorest example of a Christian that there ever has been. I mean, if there ever has been a Christian who didn't get it, you would be that person. You are so far gone, it is not even funny. Look at you, you are pathetic. Can I just show you a replay of this? This was amazing, let's just watch it one more time. That's you, wow! And you're like, I know. And the same person who enticed you with the promise is now crushing you with the accusation. And this is partly a little, you know, tip to next week, and we let him. He goes, I mean, you, you're, you're an idiot. I know. You are so pathetic. I know. I cannot believe you. I know. I can't believe me either. Instead of going, shut up. You got me into this. Shut up. I'm done with you. We're like, oh, I know, I know, I know. I should feel terrible. And then he puts condemnation on our lives, which is the ultimate blow. Because that's what you do to a building right before you tear it down. You say, this has no more purpose. It has no more value. It has no more future. It has no more worth. It's going to be torn down. It is condemned. And as soon as he puts that label on your life, you're done. You're sunk but you know, he's crafty. So if you're a Christian, he's not done with you yet. You're like, man, I know. He just like drops me off right there at condemnation. Oh no, he doesn't. He's crafty. So he's not done with you at condemnation. Not as a believer. As a believer, he's going to lean into the fact that there's probably some conviction going on from the spirit of God, right? Not condemnation. God doesn't condemn you. He convicts you. So if you feel worthless and like you're gonna be torn down, there's no value, no future, that came from the enemy. If you feel like you need to make a shift and make a pivot and make a big change, that came from God. You gotta be careful which voice you're listening to. Because the enemy, he's smart. <laughs> I grew up in a culture of rededication. I don't know if you did or not. Anybody? It's the second way we got decisions at church. So we were given an invitation. If nobody wanted to get saved, we'd quickly shift to, maybe someone needs to rededicate their lives. And then the enemy would be like, oh yeah, they do. He does. Sorry. <laughs> Unless you do. And maybe you don't. She does. This is your time. Go down. Go down front. Pray the prayer. Write your sin on a piece of paper, wad it up, throw it in the fire. You ever go to that retreat? Write it on a piece of paper, we got a big cross, we're gonna nail them all up on the cross. You ever go to that one? Did you ever throw a stick in the fire? Did you ever draw a line in the sand? Did you ever make a promise? Did you ever get there and get down on your knees and say, dear God, I promised you, if you will forgive me this time, I will never, ever, 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 do this again. Well, A, he's already forgiven you, so that's a whole other thing for another day. We're going to get there. And then you got up and you were like, <sighs> rededicated that one. But the problem was, it was your promise. Can I just didn't ask, how good is your promise? Horrible. No? Did you ever come back and get back down on your knees and pray a prayer like this? Lord, I know that I said last time that that was the last time. But I'm, this is different this time. If you'll forgive me this time, I swear to God, to you, that I will never, ever be back here like I was last time. Did you ever rededicate your rededication? There's little worse than rededicating your rededication for the fifth time. 
Lord. No, 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 no. All that other stuff, that's history. This time, I feel something different this time. I promise, I swear, you have my word. If I get out of this, anyone? No. If the results come back, if somehow I get through this, I swear. But you're in a spiral. And if you don't know what it is and how to get out of it, you just went through doorway number one, the first solution of the enemy. Man, I got, I got something for you, rededicate. Maybe try rededicating. Go down front. Go down to the altar. Pray another prayer. Make a big promise to God. The problem with rededicating is it's all about our promising God what we're going to do. And victory only comes when we raise our hands and surrender and say, obviously, I can't do much to change this situation, but you can do something to change the situation. So instead of wadding up a piece of paper and throwing it in the fire, I'm going to open my heart up to the investigation of the Holy Spirit, to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, to the finished work of Jesus, and to the hard work of making the changes to take my life back. Yeah, that's the part that God's inviting us to. And the enemy, if he can, he'll get you rededicating your rededication so long until you get to that place called hopeless. This is never going to change. And like I said before, I'm, I'm just speaking to somebody. Listen, we've all been there. I've been there. Let me just say it that way where you thought either there's something wrong with the gospel, it's not what they say it is, or you thought there's something wrong with me, or both. And so many people check out a church right there because they're like, I'm done with this because I don't get it or it doesn't get me. But a lot of people stay. And I think that a lot of people are in this room right now who are like, I know this world. But the enemy's still not done with you yet. There's one last thing. The last place in this spiral is that you find yourself down there, vulnerable. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You're weak now. You've been through the ringer emotionally and spiritually and who knows what else, relationally. There's been consequences and collateral and you're isolated more than likely. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. They went and hid and tried to become invisible to God so that when he came walking in the garden, they're all like hiding out, hoping he won't find them. Because at the bottom of this spiral, we have a tendency to hide, to hide from our friends, to hide from God, to hide from ourselves, which is crazy. But here you are isolated and weak and empty and vulnerable. And you know what's probably happening? Whatever that longing was that got you into this in the first place is probably exposed again. I need worth, I need significance, I need value, I need happiness, I need satisfaction, I need fulfillment in my life. Look at me. And all of a sudden the enemy comes with solution number two. It's not rededication, it's called temptation. And he steps in oftentimes with the very same temptation and says, man, you need a lift. <laughs> you, need, you need a spark. You need a drink. <laughs> you need a little joy. And can I highlight the momentary pleasure that you had? Can we just get a big highlighter out and circle the fact that you felt good for a little bit when we went down this road last time? And hey, here's the big news. And this is where he really 
crushes you and me. He says, I don't know, why not just do it again? We've already done it once. We've already broken through that barrier. You've already lost trust. You already broke your word. You already lied one time. You already went down this road one time. You've already thrown it all away one time. What's the big deal in doing it one more time now that you've already done it one time and you know you're gonna feel good? It's just one time and you need it. And there we are again with a thought trying to pitch a tent in our mind and build a fire and win the ground in the battle of our mind. And if we don't know what's going on, if we don't have people around us, if we don't have ways to fight, then there we go again. And there we go again. And some of you, your whole life has been, there I go again. And I just want you to know that Jesus, he fought a fight for you and established a beachhead for you. What is a beachhead? It means he went and took the important bridge necessary to win the battle. He went and took the important beach necessary for the assault. He went and took the first hill necessary to secure what was needed to win this war. Jesus and his death, burial, resurrection, and brand new life of the Spirit has established a beachhead of victory for you. He's already won the war. He's not in a fight. He's done fighting. He's not in a war. He's already the victor wearing the victor's crown. Jesus has already stormed the gates of hell for you. And he has established a beachhead for you. And what he's saying to you today is, I know you've been in this spiral for so long, but you can come onto the beachhead called victory and stand here with me starting right now. And yeah, we got fights to fight. We got cities to take. We got ground to take. We got land to take back. We got stuff to redo. We've got stuff to undo, but we're going to do it from this beachhead of victory. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. Next week, we're going to talk about how God blows up the spiral of sin and temptation and how he abundantly makes it possible for you and me to jettison from this crazy pattern and cycle and to live free. He said, there's no temptation. We're going to unpack this, the whole talk that has taken you, except that it's common to man and God is faithful. Listen to this. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you may endure it. This is God's word. And this word is going to work. And you are going to see a victory because the battle, it belongs to the Lord.